Okay, um, folks, so this is uh, Time Zone 2, May 2018, the higher level paper one for chemistry. So, periodic table, put that off the side. Uh, questions 1 to 10, here we go. So, what is the number of atoms of oxygen? Oh, I'm getting the calculator, I'm not allowed the calculator. Uh, what is the number of atoms of oxygen in two moles of hydrated sodium carbonate? Sodium carbonate is the decahydrate with the water crystallization, and of course, we've got Avogadro's constant because you need to multiply to get the number of atoms. So how many oxygen atoms in the formula? Well, there's three there plus 10 there, so that's 13 oxygen atoms in total. And of course, we've got two moles of this, so we're gonna have to double that, so that's 26 uh, moles of oxygen atoms. Okay, if there's 26 moles of oxygen atoms in two moles of this, uh, then we need to multiply this by the Avogadro uh, constant. So basically, let's just have to say, right, that's 6 times 26, because you don't have a calculator, so that's 6 times 26, what is that? That's uh, 620 is 120, plus 36, that'd be 156. Okay, but it's not actually 6 times 26, it's 6 times 10 to the 23, so it's actually 156 times 10 to the 23. Now, matching these up, okay, it's obviously not these two, because this is where, I don't know where they were getting these from, but these are just kind of random uh, numbers, it seems. I can see the six, yeah, they've gone, they're just taking the three from them, times it by two, they're taking the 26 then as the 13 and just times it by two. But we need these, so it's looking more like this one, isn't it? Because that's 156 times 10 to the 23. If we write that in standard form, then it becomes, okay, just the first number, 1.56 times 10 to the, you sort of like move an extra space, an extra face, so that'd be 25, uh, and then that runs to 1.6 times 10 to the 25, so it will be D. Number two, what is the volume in centimetres cubed of the final solution of 100 centimetres cubed of a solution containing 1.42 grams of sodium sulphate is diluted to this concentration? Okay, well, there's a very useful expression, which is Ni equals Nf. Because basically, when you dilute a solution, you don't change the number of moles of the substance. You just add in water. And then if Ni, of course, is Ci times Vi, then Nf will be Cf times Vf. So we know the final concentration. We know the initial volume. Uh, we're going to need to know the uh, initial concentration. So if we work out the uh, initial concentration, how many moles of sodium sulphate have we got? Well, it's 1.42 grams divided by 142. So our N of sodium sulphate is M over MR. That's 1.42 divided by 142. Now we can see that is 100 times bigger than that number. So it's, not, it's going to be 0 0.01 because it's one hundredth of it. Okay, that's the number of moles and that's the volume. So what's our concentration, our initial concentration of Na2SO4? Well, that is, if we leave this in centimetres cubed, that makes my life a bit easier because we've got our answer is automatically in centimetres cubed at the end. No, 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 we want the concentration in moles per decimetre cubed. Sorry, so our concentration is... Uh, number of moles divided by volume, so that's 0 0.01 divided by now in uh, decimeters cubed, we'd have to divide that by a thousand, so that would be 0 0.1. So 0 0.01 divided by 1, well, can we make our life a bit easier there? What if we multiplied up things by uh, kind of, uh, let's say, uh, 100? That would then be equivalent to 10 divided by... Uh, no, that's multiplied by a thousand, isn't it? Sorry. So that would be equivalent to one divided by ten. So that's basically 0 0.1. So 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.1 is 0 0.1. So that's our initial concentration. So now we can use this equation then. Let's rearrange it to find the final volume. Because that's what we're looking at. So Vf equals C I V I over bring this C F down here, that's the final one. So initial concentration is 0 0.1, uh, we just worked that out, times, we can leave that as 100 because it'll give the answer automatically in centimeters cubed at the end anyway then. And then we divide by 0 0.02, our final concentration. So that would be 0 0.1 times 100, uh, so that is going to be 10. And that's divided by 0 0.02. Okay, so then if we sort of think how to make these numbers a bit easier to work with, well, let's multiply everything by 100 again. So if we multiply everything by 100, that would be 1,000 
divided by, if that's times 100, that'll be 2. So 1,000 divided by 2, which is 500. Okay, so I'm going to go with the answer C. So quite a lot of work in that one. It does test your mental maths a bit, but you can see some of the little approaches you can take about sort of multiplying numbers up a bit just to make the, the mental maths a little bit easier to see. Question three, what is the percentage yield when two grams of ethene, C2H4, is formed from five grams of ethanol? Okay, so we've got ethanol, basically C2H5OH, and then that would give us ethene by eliminating water. So our number of moles of ethanol that we start with, we've got five grams, and that's going to be divided by the relative formula mass. So our moles is five divided by 46. And then how much ethene do we make? Well, we make two grams, so the moles would be two divided by its formula for relative formula mass, which would be 28. Now, they react in a one-to-one -one ratio, so one mole of this would give you one mole of this. So the theoretical number of moles, if it was 100% yield, would be this. Okay, So that would be the theoretical number of moles that we could make. So our percentage yield is the amount we got in moles divided by the amount we could have got in moles times 100. And of course, one fraction divided by another fraction, we can simplify that to, that is equivalent to 2 over 28 times this number inverted. So it'll be times 46 over 5, and then times 100. So what does that match up best with? Uh, we got uh, let's have a look. Oh, actually, sort of, uh, we can see I've just got a sort of step too far. Sometimes they throw this in where you do have it uh, shown like this, but this isn't one of the examples here because these are all obviously uh, incorrect. So we can see how our first sum, our first uh, like uh, derivation here, is actually this one here, two over twenty-eight over five over forty-six. So we haven't needed to go on to this step, but sometimes we do. So that one will be that one. Okay, which electron transition emits energy of the longest wavelength? So it's emit. So if it's emitting energy, it's not going to be this one or this one, which are absorbing energy. And longest wavelength will be lowest energy. Remember, because energy and frequency go in the opposite direction to wavelength. So high energy, high frequency, uh, low or short wavelength. So... Uh, we're looking for the one which is the lowest energy. Well, this one's going to be a big change in energy. That's going to be visible and ultraviolet uh, there. So this it's ultraviolet overall, whereas this one's only going to be infrared. So we're going to go with A. That's the smallest change in energy, which will be the longest wavelength emitted. Number five, the graph shows the first ionization energy of some consecutive elements. Now, notice this two, three, three pattern, which is quite uh, sort of easy to spot going across periods two and three. Because there, of course, you're removing an electron from uh, a P sublevel rather than an S. And here you're removing an electron from a doubly occupied P orbital as opposed to a singly occupied one. So what we look like is that this is a noble gas. Uh, and that's why we get this sharp drop in ionization energy because we're having to start a new shell, which is further from the nucleus. So this is going to be group 0, although the IB would like to call it group 18. So 0 or 18. And then, of course, this would be uh, group 1, group 2. We're not into the transition there, those yet, the fact that we've got this 2 3, three formation. So then this would be something like aluminium, uh, then group 14, group 15, 16, 17, and then 18 again, back to the noble gases. Of course, in GCSE, we would have just called them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, and so on. But um, I'd be the first to call them out. So let's see what we've got. Y is in group 3. Well, I think Y is in group 5, if anything, or what we should call group 15. Uh, y is in group 10. No, it's in group 15. Uh, X is in group 5. No, it's not. X is in group 18. Yeah, that makes sense. Group 18, otherwise known as group 0, the noble gases, highest ionization energy, and then a sharp drop afterwards because we start a new shell. So it will be D. Okay, which element across a period, which increases across a period from left to right? Ionic radius, electronegativity, well, that will decrease. Uh, well, it, it does a funny thing, to be honest. It sort of, um, it decreases because, first of all, you have your positive uh, ions because metals will tend to lose electrons, and then it will jump up a bit and decrease again because then you get into negative non-metal ions, which, of course, gain electrons. Uh, so that's a incorrect because it, it does decrease and then it jumps up and decreases again electronegativity does increase from left to right because the atoms get smaller and so it's easier to attract a bonding pair of electrons which are in the outermost shell atomic radius 
uh, that decreases left to right because the bigger nuclear charge pulls the electron shells in more tightly. Uh, ionic radius, again, we've discounted that one already. First ionization energy, that increases from left to right because the bigger nuclear charge uh, attracts the outer electrons more strongly, so that's a tick. Uh, sorry, I should put a cross there, and then atomic radius decreases. And then atomic radius, well, atomic radius decreases because you're adding electrons to the same shell. The bigger nuclear charge pulls them in tighter, so the atom is smaller. So it must be this one, yes, first ionization energy, and yes, electronegativity. Remember, basically, what atomic radius does the others then do the opposite. So if atomic radius increases, going across, uh, decreases, sorry, going across uh, a period, then electronegativity, ionization energy, and um, electron affinity uh, all do the opposite of that. They all increase, and you get the same uh, going down the group. Which element is in the P block? Well, here's where our periodic table comes in handy. So this is the P block around about here. So we can see that lead is in the P block, uh, P block there. So our answer is lead number eight part of the spectrochemical series is shown for transition metal complexes so we've got ammonia is higher than water higher than chloride higher than iodide water increases the pd separation more than chloride but we're not talking about uh, separating the p and d sub level we're talking about uh, remember the difference between the split d sub level so this is the five orbitals of the d sub level and the size of the split in is affected by the uh, the ligands as one uh, factor. So it's not the PD, it's the DD separation. And uh, yeah, water is higher on the spectrochemical series than chloride. Uh, so uh, it therefore will, the higher it is in the spectrochemical series, the greater the split in. So that is correct. A complex with chloride is more likely to be blue than that with ammonia. Well, if it's appearing blue, it's absorbing a lower energy form of light, which would actually be copper, uh, sorry, orange. Uh, which we don't actually have the, uh, the color wheel with us, but if it's appearing blue, that would indicate it's absorbing a lower energy form of light. Uh, so it doesn't look like a bad answer, because orange is uh, a low energy form of light, and therefore chloride would be absorbing a lower energy form of light than the ammonia would, because higher is in the spec ammonia is higher in the spectrochemical series and has a, a greater split in. Uh, but I know that copper chloride uh, is a yellow colour, and I know that sort of um, copper with ammonia is quite a sort of a, like a royal blue colour. So although it's not a bad answer, I'm more in favour of this one. Okay. So it would have been nicer maybe if they picked a colour where so like it was uh, actually lower in energy and therefore it would be more obvious that it was wrong. But I'm not going with that one. Complexes with water are always blue. Well, not necessarily. Iron free uh, can be water. Uh, sorry, I don't know what's the matter with me today. Iron 3 can be yellow, uh, iron 2 plus can be a green colour, so just because copper is blue doesn't mean they're all blue, so not that one, so we're going to go with B. And then number 9, what is the formula of magnesium nitride? Well magnesium is Mg2 plus, nitride is N3 minus, because it's in group 5, likes to gain free electrons. We need to put them together so they cancel out, the common factor would be uh, 6, so therefore we need 3 of these, 2 of those. Uh, and then they would cancel each other out. So we'd be looking for Mg3N2, that would be D. And then the last one for this video, number 10, which species has the longest carbon to oxygen bond length? Well, in this one, it's a triple bond, so it's not that one. In this one, we've got a double bond, it's not that one. In this one, we've just got a single bond, so that looks good to me. And then in this one, of course, we've got the FNO8 ion, where it's actually a resonance hybrid, which is two carbon oxygen bonds are somewhere in between a double and a single, but it's still, it's going to be shorter and stronger than just a single bond on its own. So we're going for the, uh, the single bond in the alcohol methanol, so that will be B.